Hello everyone and welcome to the webcast on Smart Connected Operations, Capturing the Business Value of Industrial IoT. My name is Mehul Shah and I'll be your host for the webcast today. Before we start, a few housekeeping items. Uh, these uh, lines are muted today so that we don't have any disturbances during the webcast. This is also in recorded line. There are two ways we will be able to communicate with us. Uh, the first one is the Q&A box that you will see on your panel. If you have any questions regarding the content, regarding some of the things that we're going to present today, please uh, put your question in the Q&A box and we will try to answer that at the end of the presentation. You will also see a chat box. Uh, if you have any issues with uh, the technical issues with the webcast, if you're not able to listen or not, if you're not able to get the slides, please uh, put your comments in the chat box and we'll try to respond to you right away. If you have any questions after the presentations, you can also email us at info at lnsresearch.com and we will try to answer your questions. We would like to thank the sponsors for the webcast, Cisco, GE, Rockwell Automation, Aegis Software, and Sight Machine. All of these companies provide solutions to help manufacturing organizations with some of the concepts that we're going to discuss today on smart connected operations. So I would recommend that, recommend that you reach out to these companies as well as check out their website and see how they can be of assistance to your organization. I would also like to talk a little bit about the speakers for today's presentation. We have Matthew Littlefield and Dan McLovick today as speakers for our webcast. Matt is a co-founder for of LNS Research and he also leads the re our research organization. He has spent the last decade in the research industry helping industrial executives streamline their global businesses and achieve operational excellence. He is very passionate about the industrial value chain. He has first-hand experience in the manufacturing industry. He has spent around five years working with several global manufacturers in engineering and shop floor management roles. He also has a master's in industrial engineering and operations research. Our second speaker for the webcast is Dan McLewick. Dan leads uh, asset performance management and energy management research for LNS. Dan has over 40 years of experience in manufacturing, IT, R&D, engineering, and sales roles across several industries. Dan has worked with various organizations across the globe throughout his career. He served as managing vice president in the industrial advisory services group at Gartner, where he also led the company's manufacturing research team. Before his time at Gartner, he has had, he has had more than 20 years of industry experience across several manufacturing, consulting, and uh, software companies. Before I pass it on to Matthew, uh, I quickly want to set up the agenda for today's webcast. Today we are going to cover three key areas. One is around the definition of smart connected operation. We hear a lot of companies, a lot of executives talking about smart connected operations, Industry 4.0, Industrial Internet of Things, there are many different terms and there are many distinct viewpoints out in the marketplace. So we'll try to provide our framework, our insights on how we see this industry and how manufacturing executives can leverage some of these frameworks to improve their global businesses. Second, we'll share some of the data that we've collected from nearly 500 manufacturing organizations. This is research that will provide insights on how are manufacturers investing in solutions when it comes to smart connected operations and what kind of uh, impact they'll see on their businesses. The final part would be some real life examples some pilot cases on where are companies actually starting these projects. We have seen a lot of examples in the consumer world with smart cars, smartphones, but how is it going to impact manufacturing and industrial organizations? Finally, if you know, as I mentioned before, if you have any questions and answers, uh, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to add your questions in the Q&A uh, box on your panel, and we will try to answer that question during the end of the presentation. So without further ado, I'll pass it on to Matthew Littlefield, who will be our first speaker for the webcast today. Thanks, Mehul. Well, I want to echo Mehul's sentiments on thanking our sponsors. Um, 
And I'm really excited for everyone who joined us here today to talk about this really important topic in the manufacturing and process industries world today, the Industrial Internet of Things. Uh, I hope to lend some clarity to a space that has been uh, confusing at best with lots of different voices, lots of different messages, lots of folks in the industry saying the same thing lots of different ways. So hopefully uh, this new research based on uh, hundreds of survey responses and, and interviews will, will lend some clarity to what's going on today. And before I get started, I do want to share a little bit about who LNS Research is and how we collect our data. I think that'll inform everyone on the line in terms of how to use this research and how to use this data um, to make better decisions in your own businesses around technology uh, and how it can help drive uh, better performance and uh, better leadership. So who is LNS Research? We are a uh, research and technology firm. Uh, we differentiate ourselves by having experienced analysts on staff uh, that have a wealth of both research experience as well as specific industry experience. Uh, we conduct all our own primary research through um, surveys and interviews, um, uh, very much leveraging our social research model, uh, which drives uh, engagement at the very beginning of the um, solution selection and, and performance improvement process that manufacturers go through. And the final piece is, is we try and make our research as visually appealing and, and simple to understand as possible. Uh, I think research can be complex because of its very nature, so, so we don't only, only try and simplify what goes on in manufacturing, but we also try and simplify overall how to use research and understanding it. So this is the, the research model that we use. Uh, our surveys are structured around these um, five different areas. Um, you'll see a lot of our data shared today and our frameworks really ref reflecting a lot of this um, in how we present the research. So we start with strategic objectives. We want to understand what manufacturing organizations are uh, trying to accomplish, uh, both within uh, maybe a particular organization within manufacturing. So what's quality department trying to uh, accomplish? What's the manufacturing organization or the reliability organization trying to accomplish? Um, but then also we want to understand how that ties into the larger um, corporate or financial objectives. Um, and we also want to understand what are those challenges in achieving those objectives um, and, and how are we going to overcome those objectives. The next thing we look at are metrics. We want to help manufacturers understand what are the right metrics to, to measure for the right strategic objectives they're trying to accomplish. We want to help manufacturers understand um, how they compare in these metrics to their peer group. Um, so what's the median as well as what are those top performers. So what's the, the, the top performance as well as the top 25% or top quartile in a particular metric look like. And then we want to understand what are those best practices maybe around technology, business process, or leadership that drives uh, demonstrable improvement benefits in those metrics. So that's the benchmarking piece. And then finally, you'll hear us talking quite a bit around our model of operational excellence. Um, there's a lot of, again, different definitions around operational excellence. It seems like every company has created their own model. We, in fact, had a webcast a few weeks ago for our executive council on what operational excellence is. But it's really around, for us, um, taking the pillars of operational excellence, which can be tailored for each company, but, but we see those um, coming together around manufacturing operations, quality, environmental health and safety, um, asset performance management, energy management, quality management, um, to drive really a um, business operating system. So what are the leadership, business process, and technology capabilities that you need to drive your overall continuous improvement journey? And that's really that measure, validate, and improve piece of the research model. So here are the research demographics for our Manufacturing Operations Management Survey. Uh, it has over 500 respondents. Uh, we're continually collecting data for this ongoing um, research project. Uh, and as you can see, we have a, a good mix of manufacturers that have participated um, across small, medium, and large. Um, when we look at the company location, we see um, no majority, but we do have a, a good spread between North America and Europe uh, with a significant piece from Asia and rest of the world. And when you look at um, the industries, we do have majority discrete manufacturing, uh, but as you can see, we also have um, food and beverage and CPG on the batch side. We have life sciences, which we call it separately, which accounts for both batch and uh, discrete manufacturing, but because of the regulatory um, requirements for the industry, we call those out separately. And then we have the process manufacturing as well. 
And that process um, demographic is expanding, especially around some of uh, the research that Dan's doing on asset reliability and asset performance management, as well as some of our new research on environmental health and safety. That's um, ramping up our process industries coverage. So we do have the quantitative piece, but we also have the qualitative piece. Um, so we'll, we'll try and interject stories um, throughout. Um, you'll see where we have called out specific use cases and specific pilot projects that we've seen in industry. Uh, a number of these come from uh, members of our executive council. You know, our executive councils meet quarterly um, uh, on a web-based portal where we share stories, bring in guest speakers, um, have peer discussions, uh, share research really to, to drive camaraderie, common understanding, and move the whole industry forward on, on some of these topics. So where does the IIoT, or the Industrial Internet of Things, and big data analytics fit within uh, the manufacturing industry today? And I want to start really where we always start, which is objectives and challenges. And one of the things that we've seen, and it, I think it's, it's pretty interesting, is that even with all of the technology change that has happened over the past uh, four or five years in the, in the industry, with the emergence of Industry 4.0, uh, the emergence of, of new technologies where we've seen uh, the cost of compute come down, uh, the cost of storage come down, the cost of sensors come down, where we're really at this tipping point now, uh, the, the high-level objectives and business challenges in manufacturing haven't, haven't demonstrably changed over that time period. Uh, we're still seeing manufacturers wanting to be and striving to be customer focused um, and uh, looking to improve uh, the quality of products delivered to customers. Uh, they want to be more responsive in their supply chains. Uh, they want to improve the new product introduction process. These are all the the, the goals that that we've been talking about for uh, as long as as long as we've been doing manufacturing. Right? These are consistent and ongoing objectives. Um, the challenge is. In many cases, manufacturers have struggled to improve. Uh, they've tried to adopt new technology. They've tried to get close to their customers. Uh, you know, they've been on lean journeys or pull manufacturing journeys for a long, long time, uh, but haven't necessarily seen the results that they're looking for. Um, and that's where we see the industrial Internet of Things uh, coming in. Really, a new paradigm, a new technology um, framework that can help um, manufacturers address these business goals and challenges that they faced for a long time. Uh, and what are some of those challenges? So, so why are companies struggling to uh, deliver quality products to market? Why are they struggling to be um, responsive in their supply chains? And, and why do they not always deliver products as quickly as they want to market? Uh, the number one issue we see are uh, collaboration across departments. This, in particular, happens in a number of areas. Uh, we see it very often happening in quality. So the quality organization, the manufacturing organizations can often be contentious and have um, different perspectives on um, what quality is and how it can be delivered to the customer. Uh, we can see it between engineering and manufacturing, so um, not always a common understanding of the challenges in product design and process design and how uh, the realities of the shop floor impact what happens in engineering and vice versa. So there's gaps there. Um, there can be gaps and challenges between um, uh, asset management and maintenance and operations, not always being on the same page in the trade-offs between uptime, uptime and reliability as well as um, um, throughput and customer delivery. And then probably the biggest one that's applicable to the topic today around the Industrial Internet of Things is the, the gaps between uh, IT organizations and operations and even automation. So there's really three organizations there, even though often we only talk about ITOT convergence. Um, you know, the IT organizations traditionally live in a world uh, that may not be as mission critical as most manufacturing organizations uh, live in, uh, where definitions of redundancy and determinism and reliability uh, of a network um, can be very different in manufacturing than they can be in the corporate environment. And there's often uh, a mistrust or gap of understanding there. And, and vice versa, uh, in the manufacturing world, very often we're focused on solving specific problems, engineering specific solutions, uh, without necessarily putting in place the rigor, uh, governance, needs requirements that um, 
IT organization is really very skilled at and very experienced at doing. So um, all too often we see more manufacturing organizations building solutions that are narrowly focused on specific problems without uh, the forward thought of scalability, uh, which is why we have so many islands of automation and information manufacturing. So these are all uh, collaboration areas where we work, we work, where we work with manufacturers um, all the time on, on how to how to break down these silos. So that that's the number one area, and I think really justifies some some thought and work on trying to break down those silos. Um, not surprisingly, I think falling right behind that and very connected to that idea of of uh, improving collaboration between departments are those disparate systems and data sources. If all of these organizations are operating independently and not collaborating. Um, it's not surprising that they each have their own systems and solutions, uh, their own pieces of software, their own databases, their own spreadsheets. And there isn't necessarily that connection between. Uh, data doesn't flow easily. Uh, applications don't connect across. Uh, usability can be a challenge. So these desperate data systems and, and data are a big challenge. And then another one I think worth talking about is our ROI justification for improvement in, in investments. We have in our capital, uh, approval process in manufacturing, very rigorous requirements um, and very strict measurements around uh, how we drive performance benefit, how it drives to the bottom line. And very often in these large traditional MES projects or other projects in manufacturing, uh, ROI can, can seem elusive, uh, both in how to calculate it, what are those right metrics, and then, and then achieving it. Um, so those are some of the challenges that, that we see around manufacturing today and addressing these objectives. Uh, and again, these have been here for a long time. We've consistently seen the same ones uh, bubbling to the top in these surveys. And um, what I think is um, important now is, is starting to talk about how the industrial internet of things can start uh, addressing some of these traditional challenges. So I want to start off just with a with a definitional slide. A slide. What is the Industrial Internet of Things? Um, you know, lots of folks have lots of different definitions. Um, you know, I think it's interesting to start off by by talking about what is a thing. Um, you know, is it just a a device, a physical thing, or does it include processes? Does it include people? And I think the the best definition is really to take a broad view of what a thing is. Uh, really, I think when you talk about the Internet of Things or the Industrial Internet of Things, which is a subset of the Internet of Things, it's about uh, the network of networks of IP connected people, processes, and physical things uh, to enable new cyber physical systems, um, those types of systems that bring people together closer to technology and working together. So that's, I think, a good working definition of the Industrial Internet of Things. Uh, it is the subset of the Internet of Things where the um, use of those things is um, connected to uh, the production of physical goods uh, or the maintenance of physical goods. Uh, and it really does take a broad definition of what things are. You know, anytime you, you bring up the, the, the buzzword, the Internet of Things, uh, which really is at the top of the, of the hype cycle today, um, you, you get questions around how does that connect to all these different initiatives and forums and consortiums that are out there today. And there really has been a proliferation of groups um, by industry or by geography. Um, some that are really leading um, today. Uh, you have uh, Industry 4.0 and the Smart Manufacturing Leadership Council, uh, which are both worth mentioning. Um, you know, these are really government-led organizations um, trying to drive the manufacturing renaissance within each of their respective um, countries. Uh, and they are generally collaborative uh, endeavors between uh, you know, public entities, private entities, um, including governments, um, higher learning, and industry. You know, there are, I'd say, kind of as these initiatives have grown, some both geographic associations as well as political associations to them. So Industry 4.0 is certainly known as German. Smart Manufacturing is certainly known as American. There's others for other countries. So um, I really view these today as, as a subset of the Industrial Internet of Things or uh, the Internet of Things. Uh, we also see the Industrial Internet Consortium, uh, which is 
um, kind of gaining traction. We've seen at many events. Uh, there's also the IoT World Forum, which is worth mentioning. Uh, lots of these are generally um, kind of vendor-supported awareness groups um, trying to identify and define what is the Internet of Things or Industrial Internet of Things, what are the use cases, what are the benefits, what are the solutions that can help address that. Uh, so I see these more as um, kind of market awareness initiatives um, driven by the vendors towards the um, manufacturing and end-user organizations. I think over time we'll see this switching from vendor push to uh, end-user pull. We're already starting to see those, those trends take shape. Uh, but I do think we will see over time some consolidation. Right now there's lots and lots of different consortiums uh, and groups, and I think uh, we'll see those coalescing between uh, between a, a few strong um, groups. And it's also worth noting that lots of the, the vendors in the space have developed their own kind of thought leadership around uh, what is their version of the Internet of Things, but I think the, the IoT or IIoT are the, the terms that are really most vendor neutral and the market in general is really rallying around. So I think these are, these are those terms that are safe for everyone to use. Uh, they don't have any political, geographic, or uh, vendor um, uh, baggage that go with them. So I mentioned this a little bit as one of the major um, group gaps within manufacturing organizations around IT and OT. And um, we spent a lot of time interviewing companies talking about uh, the differences between IT and OT organizations and, and really trying to understand, have a common definition of what IT, OT convergence is today. And, and a lot of folks talk about it and think about it. And there are distinct viewpoints around ITOT to convergence out there. Uh, and I just wanted to have a discussion. And I'd be interested in, in questions that others may have around this and looking forward to, to answering those. But in my estimation, the ITOT convergence has been happening for as long as uh, IT groups and automation groups have existed. Um, and there have been several different um, realizations of what these what the trend looks like. And these are all ongoing and uh, accelerating. But there is a difference today between uh, what the trend looked like 10 or 20 years ago. Uh, so I think uh, the first major push around ITOT convergence was around open standards and um, formal collaboration between IT and OT groups. And really, in my mind, this is uh, the movement of uh, Microsoft technologies, uh, Windows server technology on the shop floor being used in manufacturing. I think that was the first major ITOT um, convergence trend. Uh, and that continues today. Um, uh, Microsoft certainly is one of the dominant players uh, in the manufacturing uh, infrastructure network. Uh, the next trend uh, really started around um, uh, the, the early 2000s, and that was in the extension of corporate networks into the plant networks and the use of uh, Ethernet in manufacturing. Uh, prior to that, it really had been all uh, proprietary or standards-based protocols, but not Ethernet-based protocols. Um, and we've seen a steady progression towards more and more Ethernet across manufacturing. Uh, you know, it's still not used in uh, every scenario today, uh, but it's certainly increasing. Uh, and the uh, reliability, determinism, and robustness of, of, the, of the protocol itself continues to uh, extend itself into, into new scenarios across manufacturing. And we, we expect to see that trend continuing over time. And I think that uh, both of those trends have, have enabled, in part, uh, this newest trend, which is around uh, what we're seeing IoT-enabled assets, operations, and business systems. Uh, so as more and more, as I mentioned before, uh, devices are connected, as there's more compute power at the edge, as there's more use of the cloud, uh, as there's more analytics throughout, um, we're really going to see this explosion of um, IoT-enabled uh, devices. Uh, and this is where we, we see ITOT convergence really coming to a head over the next few years and really accelerating over time. Yeah, so, so we do believe this trend is new. Uh, it's a new flavor of ITOT convergence, and it's going to, we believe, accelerate quite more quickly than um, than some of those previous trends. So, in in our survey, we have asked uh, some recent questions around the IoT adoption, and um, I think we found some some pretty interesting results that I'm excited to share. Uh, our first question was around adoption and um, what stage 
companies are in in terms of, of planning. Um, so not surprising, the largest segment, but not the majority, right at 47%, was currently not planning to adopt IoT technology and really not having a timeline yet for that. So we're not sure when we're going to adopt. Um, the next largest, uh, at 19%, so just less than a fifth, was we're not investing in IoT, and, and it's definitely not for, for the next year. And then the remainder, which is just about a third of respondents, were at some stage of adoption. Um, so this is either um, full steam ahead, currently in pilot, or planning a project within the next 12 months. Uh, so you have a third of the market today, or just over a third actually, in that, in that early adopter stage. So I, th I thought that was interesting, uh, but it's even more interesting when you couple that with our, our next question which was, where do you see the impact of the Internet of Things, uh, or the industrial Internet of Things? And the major result there was around the 44%, the largest category. These are, don't understand or don't know about the, the Internet of Things. Um, surprising with all the hype and buzz that's in the market today, but again, not, not surprising with how new uh, the term and technologies are. So really, when you think about that, 47% not investing, and we don't know when we're going to invest, alongside the 44% or overlapping, the 44% that say, we don't understand the IoT. We don't know what it is. That's one of the biggest um, findings that I see from the study, is that despite all the buzz, there's still a large swath of the market today that doesn't understand. And because they don't understand, uh, they have no plans to adopt. So I really see um, two major um, events or objectives that um, we as educators and influencers in the market um, have to undertake over the next one to two years really to, to make this technology reality in the industrial space. Uh, first, it is taking those the early market, the enthusiasts and visionaries, um, documenting and proving the ROI cases, and then using those to educate and move the mainstream into adoption. And you know this is not different than any other um, technology adoption um, curve. You know, it's the very typical uh, crossing of the chasm where you have uh, an early set of the market adopting and moving, and you have uh, the broad market um, having not made a decision, sitting on the sideline, and it's about educating and motivating these, or these organizations. So um, really, that's what the, the rest of this presentation is going to all be about. It's about educating and, and showing what those use cases are and those pilot projects can be to uh, move the whole industry forward. So I want to start by talking about the traditional value chain um, architecture that we have in manufacturing. So this is the LNS research take on um, the whatever you want to call it, Purdue model or S95 stack. Um, you know, it is the architectural layered approach to manufacturing systems. You know, we look at five layers. At the top, you have your governance and planning systems, uh, and at the very bottom, you have the the physical assets and physical uh, equipment. And at each layer, you get more granular. Uh, you collect different types of data, and uh, you have more real-time control. You know, this is the framework that we've used for, for many, many years, decades within manufacturing. Uh, this is how we have, in the past, thought about shop floor to top floor connectivity. Uh, and the truth of the matter is, uh, most companies, if not all companies, uh, haven't truly achieved uh, the vision of shop floor top floor connectivity. And I think there are a number of reasons of why this has persisted as a, as a gap over time. Uh, and I think those challenges will persist until the, the mindset around this architecture changes. So one of the challenges that, that the industry faces that, that holds back um, integration across the stack is, is different levels of maturity and adoption. Uh, so when we look at the, the lower levels uh, in process automation, there is broad adoption. M manufacturers today largely have automated their facilities. And then when we look at the, the business systems, um, your engineering systems, your inventory systems, your financial systems, uh, again, there's broad adoption. Uh, you know, our research shows 90 plus percent of companies have an ERP system, for example. 
It could be old. It could be legacy. There could be multiple. But there is you know, enterprise level systems there in most cases. It's in the middle, the manufacturing operations layer, uh, the plant, uh, and the systems that help manage the plant where we see major gaps. You know, we only see about 30% adoption of off-the-shelf uh, MES type systems, uh, which leaves a large majority of the company with homegrown or paper-based systems still at uh, the level three. So that's one reason why information doesn't flow quite as easily or as quickly from the bottom to the top as, as we might like. Another issue is just around data type uh, and quantity of data at each level. So transactional systems like financial inventory systems uh, only need certain and only require certain data and only want certain data. Uh, they don't want all process parameters that are in a data historian. They don't want all machine data that are connected to an asset. That data would overwhelm a transactional system if it all flowed up. Uh, so we may talk about flowing that data up, but in today's um, world, you know, a business warehouse or an ERP database is not set up to, to accept all that data. Uh, the same is true when you look at uh, the connection between MES and process control. Um, you know, MES systems are mainly concerned about quality inventory, uh, maintenance, and uh, production. Uh, they're not necessarily uh, concerned with all aspects of uh, controlling the real-time systems. And again, uh, those those databases will be overwhelmed, uh, and that's the reason we have things like data historians. And then, again, even when we think about the specific assets and all the information that a specific asset collects, um, all that information is not required by the control system. You know, if that particular, particular tag or data type isn't required for control, the controller doesn't want it. Uh, it doesn't actually even know what to do with it in a traditional uh, master-slave relationship. Um, so for these reasons, across the stack, uh, it just doesn't make sense. The architecture is not going to bring all the data from the bottom to the top or back down again. And then, of course, we have the challenge of the network, which is the third major piece of, of why I see companies not being able to flow information seamlessly from top to bottom. Um, you have the traditional corporate network. You have the plant network. Uh, in, in many cases, these networks are not well connected. Uh, it could be for security f fears. Uh, very often, companies have not taken the necessary steps in terms of uh, putting in place firewalls. Um, segmenting from the network, uh, putting in place demilitarized zones, uh, hardening um, uh, systems in the shop floor. Really, the blocking and tackling of security haven't been done. Uh, so many manufacturers still operate by a security by obscurity mindset or a complete isolationist mindset when it comes to operations. Um, so that, again, inhibits the flow of information between manufacturing systems and, um, and enterprise systems. So all, all of these are challenges, um, and you know, there's really no good solution given the current architecture. And this is where we see um, the Internet of Things, the Industrial Internet of Things platform, really stepping in to help transform this architecture and, and move the whole industry forward. So here is uh, our framework for the Industrial Internet of Things platform. Uh, we've published some blog posts and articles on this before, so hopefully it's not the first time you're seeing it, but, but the four major areas that we see are connectivity, cloud, big data analytics, and application development. Um, just at a high level, connectivity really is about both the hardware and software needed to provide the network infrastructure. So this is wired, Wi-Fi, and cellular. Um, it's about the standards, so moving more towards Ethernet, away, away from proprietary towards standard um, protocols. Uh, the connectivity needed to the machines in terms of gateways, uh, where it is proprietary, API web services, where it's more IT focused. Uh, there is a big component of device management, uh, so as devices and assets are IoT enabled, uh, it is about provisioning those devices uh, and managing those devices. And it's about transporting data quickly through the infrastructure, um, tunneling that data through, uh, and then triggering alarms and events off that data. Um, on the cloud side, uh, this is kind of the traditional um, private public hybrid model uh, where you're going to see uh, infrastructure platform or software as a service models um, coming about. Um, we have the big data analytics, uh, which is really about bringing some of the dashboarding 
uh, technology that's already in place in manufacturing today, um, together with some of the rich analytics that are emerging in this space, uh, and mashing those up for for new insights. So this is an area where we've seen uh, really underinvestment in manufacturing to date. Um, it's mostly been around dashboards, metrics, and alarms, and not necessarily about deep um, data science type analytics. So we, we expect to see a lot of investment and insight here over time. And then the final piece is application development. So this is about developing new software applications quickly and easily that can capitalize on IoT type schemas and data uh, to build those mashup apps. Um, so a couple of things to, to note here in this framework and in how we see the space emerging. Uh, first, you know, security here is embedded throughout. It's not a separate silo, a separate function. It really has to be part of the fabric of the platform. Uh, another piece that, that I think should be noted is uh, in today's landscape, there really is no one specific vendor that can offer all of this. For the foreseeable future, uh, it's going to be all about the ecosystem. It's going to be about multiple vendors having strength in certain areas and collaborating and partnering um, to deliver those needed capabilities for manufacturers. Um, and then finally, there's, there's been trends around cloud. There's been tr trends around big data uh, before, and those have been front and center before manufacturing. Uh, but I think more and more, it, they're, they're going to become part of the platform. They're going to be built into the systems. Um, so you'll use cloud where it makes sense, and you'll use on-prem where it makes sense. You'll use big data analytics where it makes sense, or you'll use um, traditional dashboard where it makes sense. Uh, so those are uh, some of the, the changes that I think we'll see. Um, as, as this framework really evolves over time in manufacturing. So then the final piece is, is what does this mean for uh, the traditional architecture? How is this going to change, um, change those systems? Uh, I think it's going to have some profound changes in, in a number of different ways. Uh, at the lowest level, the level 0, 1, and 2, I think you're going to see some, some flattening convergence of the architecture. Uh, you're seeing this today already in more modular approaches to automation where um, you know manufacturers of industrial equipment for example today are not just selling products they are really selling services or solutions that have embedded within that uh, the networking equipment the controls the sensors the instrumentation really to have what we're calling smart connected assets delivered on a skid or as part of a module directly to the, the factory or mine or um, whatever else, construction site, whatever it might be. Uh, within level three, the smart connected operations, uh, this is what traditionally has been known as manufacturing operations management, where MES and EMI um, systems have, have grown up and um, where they've been over time. You know, over time, level three really has, has struggled from having a, a, a well-defined scope. Um, you know, MES systems have many different definitions of scope depending on who you talk to. Uh, EMI solutions have often been thought of as both integration as well as dashboarding layers um, that really form that glue between uh, the business systems and automation systems. Um, but for all the reasons talked about um, on the previous few slides, uh, the space has been challenged to really become pervasive. Uh, so what I think will happen, the space won't go away. We still need these systems. Uh, the purpose is, is uh, well documented and, and there's value there. Uh, but I think we can become more focused within the space and say these, this is really where the, these systems make sense. Um, these are the functions that they make the most sense performing. And let's not try and do more than we should with the, with the systems that we have. But, of course, that, that leaves white space, that leaves gaps. Um, so what we see emerging is uh, what Dan describes as the IoT workspace or IoT-enabled next-gen systems. Um, so these are the systems that are going to be generally new systems or perhaps uh, replatformed um, legacy systems that can take data from anywhere, uh, deliver it to anywhere, um, so that Information doesn't necessarily have to flow through the stack entirely, uh, but can move from where it makes sense uh, to where it makes sense, uh, given the business case. Uh, and apps can be quickly and easily developed where it makes sense, uh, with the right either 
field buses or information buses or whatever it happens to be to, to move that data. So we see that space emerging. It's still not well defined uh, what that space will be called, what those systems will be called, but there's certainly a number of use cases that can be called out there around um, visualization, around um, traceability, and a whole host of others that we'll get into. But this is how we see the, the uh, architecture changing and evolving over time um, to lend focus in some areas, um, to have converged capabilities in other areas, and then um, really to provide connectivity across in other areas. So I just want to talk a little bit about the IoT-enabled legacy systems and what changes are going to happen there on the left side of that diagram, and then the IoT-enabled next-gen systems and those that look like. So on the, on the legacy system side, I think as you see more and more of the ISVs, the, the software providers in the space and hardware providers in the space partnering with the platform providers, you're going to see moves towards more open standards-based integration. Uh, you're going to see more analytics and optimization at the, ed at the edge. Um, you're going to see increasing use of, of mobile capabilities, social capabilities in cloud. Um, you'll see increasing amounts of remote monitoring and access built into the applications. And you'll see more closed-loop business processes. Uh, so being able for take quality as an example, um, being able to connect quality across engineering, manufacturing, and customer service. On the next-gen system side, um, I think you're going to see new application development um, in a number of different areas, and, and Dan will talk about some of these. Um, it's the mashup applications, being able to take logistics information, manufacturing information, engineering information to create new views that we haven't had before. Uh, it's going to be about creating traceability and gene genealogy systems. I had a conversation a few months ago with uh, the head of manufacturing for uh, one of the world's largest biotech uh, firms, and in their organization, serialization is as big an issue as Y2K and Sarbanes-Oxley was. It, it's that transformative. It's that high level of uh, visibility requirement. Um, so these traceability systems, which have never really worked in any of the layers that have to go across the layers, as we described earlier, um, really can be addressed with this new approach. Um, perhaps the most important one, and where we're seeing the most activity today, is in the new business model enablement moving from um, the traditional um, product businesses that so many manufacturers have to moving into service-enabled businesses. Uh, remote monitoring access we'll see on both sides of the fence as well as close the business processes for sure. So this will be my last slide, and then I'm going to pass it to Dan to, to wrap up. Uh, but Smart Connected Operations, this is an infographic we developed to think about what Smart Connected Operations are and how they're going to evolve over time. Um, and we have this concept of moving from real-time to predictive to autonomous, um, whereas most companies today are in the real-time phase of this maturity cycle, where the goal is to just be able to see what's happening today in real-time. You know, moving to predictive, a lot of solution providers talk about predictive analytics. Uh, and it's easy to say the words. And it's harder to, to do it in real life. Um, it's about building data models. It's about bringing that data in. Uh, it's about iterating the model over time, uh, taking data out where it doesn't make sense, adding new data in where it does. Um, so it's a, it's a process. It's a, it's a learning, the predictive side of it. Um, and it takes time. So it's a maturity curve for sure. It's not easy. But, but the idea is to get to a place where um, you know, over time you can avoid problems, not just know about them as they're happening in real time. And then the final stage is, is autonomous production. So uh, rather than um, an alert coming up telling an operator or a mechanic that um, you know a bearing or other piece of equipment may be failing soon, um, it really is going out, ordering the replacement, triggering the workflow, um, and eliminating human innovation in as many places, places as possible. And here below, we've just um, been aware of and can react to a um, list of the different types of data uh, in operations that we see manufacturing uh, being needing to be aware of and being able to react to. Um, so as you can see, it comes from a broad set of data sources uh, and is applicable to a large set of uh, business processes. 
So then I'll, I'll pass it off to Dan to talk about uh, smart connected assets and then, then walk us through some of the uh, use cases and pilots that we've seen along with some final recommendations for all our listeners. Thanks, Matt, and thanks for setting the stage so well. Now, as Matt said when he first began the uh, presentation, when we define you know, what is manufacturing, what are the these smart connected uh, operations and what are the assets that we use when he was talking about level zero and level one in the uh, hierarchy there. And he was saying that, that these assets then are used uh, to produce goods, but they can also be used to produce services. So what we're seeing is this whole concept of the internet of things at the industrial level is not just impacting traditional manufacturers that make uh, widgets or that make uh, you know, batch goods, things like drugs, pharmaceuticals, foods, things like that. We're also seeing this now starting to impact other asset intensive industries. Obviously, heavy process, oil and gas, uh, mining and metals. But if you think about it, a power generation company is a manufacturer. Uh, what they manufacture is electrons, and then they ship those electrons out, not via you know trucks or rail or whatever, but via the distribution system. So this whole idea of smart connected assets really is is transcending uh, traditional manufacturing and going into things like utilities, uh, power, water, wastewater treatment, uh, natural gas production, those kinds of things. Uh, we certainly see it in the upstream side of oil and gas as well when we look at the uh, exploration and production side, operating oil wells. And so the, the smart connected assets concept is about the convergence of the sensors, the instrumentation, the controls, and the physical assets themselves. It's about using this information uh, to react smarter, to, to do the things that need to be done and do them in the most optimal way. Uh, you know, the important term here is that it is smart and connected assets. It's not smart assets. We've had those for a long time. Uh, you know, ever since the 90s, we've had uh, digital instrumentation, uh, often capable of multiple uh, measurements in a single gauging system or whatever. Uh, we've, we've had connected assets for a long time, uh, going back for literally decades. I mean, whether you consider 4 to 20 milliamps of connection, uh, we, we've had connected assets, though, for a very long time in production and in manufacturing. Uh, when we moved to field bus in the 80s and 90s, you know, that those connections became a little stronger. Uh, obviously, with the digital side of it, uh, we started to have smart assets, and they were connected assets. But we weren't bringing the two together. What's different today is we're recognizing that it is the combination of both being smart and connected that provides that benefit. Um, we've done real-time control, but what we haven't done is real-time optimization in many cases. The idea of a smart connected asset is that it can react. It reacts to the environment around it. It looks at differences in the operations. It looks at differences in the uh, how it's performed in the past against those variables, such as raw materials, the uh, ambient environment, and things like that. And it can adjust and alter its behavior to ensure that product quality uh, is maintained. It can adjust to make sure that energy targets are met. And more importantly, if it detects that if something's going wrong, that it is not capable of achieving the objective, that it can notify people and either initiate maintenance activity automatically uh, through calling for some type of service that might be automated, or at the very least, it can call for an inspection and service by humans to come in and then intervene and do those things. This gets us then from the sort of real time to where the predictive place piece plays. Now, we definitely need those predictive analytics so that we can actually forecast what the device is going to do in the future. It's not so much just about saying, oh, this device has operated so much time, therefore it probably is going to need service. It is about looking at how the device is actually operating and then extrapolating out as to when service will be required before 
it fails to achieve one of its operational goals, be that energy consumption, be that reliability, or be it throughput, even the environmental uh, byproducts that are produced by the process that might be dependent on the equipment behavior. And then last but not least, certainly uh, the quality of the products that are produced or the goods that are produced. Ultimately, then, this does lead us to, as Matt said, the autonomous behavior. Uh, this is when the system can make those decisions based on the order file. It says, look at, you know, we, we've got an order. The order's got this much value. However, if we run the process this way and we continue operating these assets this way, we're going to cause enough damage that all of the additional incremental uh, revenue and or profit we would have obtained by fulfilling that order by the commitment date is going to be lost because of the increased uh, wear and tear on the asset or the potential uh, shortening of the service life of that asset and requiring capital replacement sooner. The other thing about smart kinetic that assets that Matt had mentioned earlier is the change in the business model. I think one of the things we're really seeing about smart connected assets is because they are aware of what's going on, they are uh, capable of predicting you know, failure times and notifying service and everything, we're starting to see much greater interest by manufacturers who are willing to sell capacity instead of capital. Now, we've seen some early examples of this. For example, you know, Rolls-Royce jet engines uh, has been for a number of years selling uh, capacity in the sense that they will actually sell pound hours of thrust essentially to airlines. Uh, the airline doesn't buy the engine. They essentially buy the thrust that that engine provides. Uh, we've seen some of the agricultural equipment uh, players do the same thing, where they're selling uh, ground, acres of ground plowed, or um, they're selling you know, seeding capacity, things like that, or combining capacity, instead of actually selling the capital equipment. And they take responsibility. This is one of the things that smart connected assets uh, enables is those changes in business models. This drives us to you know some of the business case examples that we've seen. You know, I think one of the exciting things about being involved in asset performance management is that our research we do, as well as the examples we've seen in industry, um, really point to the fact that sort of asset performance management and uh, energy management both are two of the most often cited business value use cases for the industrial Internet of Things. IoT, uh, when you go to you know, conferences from the automation community, you go to conferences from the, the mom community, uh, even from the ERP community, uh, in the EAM community, the things you hear about most when they talk about proving the value of smart connected devices is frequently in the uh, improvements in reliability, production, and throughput uh, that we've seen from smart connected assets. Uh, we've seen use cases where they talk about as much as 20% improvement in productivity and or reliability. Uh, many times the numbers aren't that high. Uh, they're typically in single digits, but in many cases they are, it can approach 20%. We've also seen because of the uh, better ability to forecast when service is needed, uh, when maintenance has to occur, uh, when you couple that to uh, the usage information of spare parts and the optimization engines that are out there now, some of the predictive analytics about uh, parts optimization, companies are able to reduce their MRO inventory. Uh, we've seen numbers uh, approaching 40% uh, of MRO inventory optimization because companies no longer have to hold material on hand just in case. Uh, they really are moving to just-in-time MRO procurement. Uh, so we're seeing a lot there. The, the second most cited cases is energy reduction. And in fact, uh, one of the case studies that we've published on our website um, in the industrial energy management practice 
uh, dealt with a uh, wastewater treatment utility in the Midwest, which used smart connected devices uh, to actually detect a problem and reduce their peak demand usage uh, and save themselves literally hundreds of thousands of dollars overnight. Uh, in one month, they were able to operate, drop their demand charge uh, by tens of thousands of dollars, which translates to you know several hundred thousand dollars a year just spread across four pumps. And you know when you start looking at that, then spreading across the entire operation, it certainly is a key opportunity. We also see that uh, when you have smart connected assets, you can actually get your plant up and running faster. Uh, you get much better diagnostic information about what is happening in the process. And so all through the commissioning and process, uh, you get better information. In industries like aerospace and medical devices and obviously pharmaceuticals, uh, the traceability and serialization is important too because with smart connected assets, one of the things we can start to detect is the asset performance. We can not only uh, track what the process is doing and the serialization with those smart assets, we can get all of the process behavior recorded. Uh, we get better information about when phase transitions happen in some cases. And with the smart connected assets, we can move that information into systems that record that for governance and compliance reasons. And, and this is going back to the slide that Matt showed where we had sort of that uh, you know, new paradigm sitting off to the right there about three slides previous where we said the IOT, IIoT smart connected uh, business systems or enterprise systems. Uh, that, that is the beauty of smart connected assets is it's going to really help us uh, tie what's happening on the plant floor into our governance and compliance systems. And then finally, the other area that we definitely see smart connected assets and the IOT uh, really starting to enable is flexible manufacturing. Uh, the ability to shift your production to, to really move toward the uh, economic order quantity of one, the ability to uh, quickly download new programming parameters. So the reason we haven't done that in the past is because frequently the ability to reconfigure an asset, a machine tool, a CNC machine, um, a, a milling machine, whatever, is because the reconfiguration time uh, to produce parts, the, the change over time, is so high that we don't have lean operations. And you know, we all are striving to reduce waste, and one of the biggest wastes is uh, you know, setup time. So the ability with smart connected assets to pre-stage uh, programs, swap them out on the fly, and literally uh, change an asset's behavior uh, we believe the IOT is going to start to enable that so that the economic order quantity uh, of one is really going to be there. The other thing, too, is not only improve customer responsiveness to where we can, uh, by being able to meet customer demand better, uh, we can get the customers better visibility into where their orders are. Uh, we can build those integrated supply chains. So the IOT is not just about what happens inside the factory. It goes into the supply chain, whether it's the supply chain on the MRO side where we're looking at the spare parts, or it's the supply chain of the raw materials and components we use in the factory to build the goods and uh, services that we produce. So I think you know, the, the business cases that we're starting to see means that the, in the industry, in manufacturing and our allied asset intensive industries like power and utilities, uh, we actually are going to see much faster business case development than we will in the consumer uh, and the healthcare and in the other areas where uh, the IoT or the you know uh, smart connected devices market is there. there. There's a lot happening in that space, but much of it is yet to be monetized. Uh, the value has yet to be ascertained. But clearly, in the manufacturing space. The, the business cases that we're seeing today are there. Uh, with that, I'm going to wrap it up with sort of the 
observations that you know sort of summarize what we've talked about today, and that is the IoT is truly transformative. Uh, we, th we think we're at a point in uh, the evolution of technology that we're at that tipping point, the hockey stick, the knee, whatever you want to call it, and that uh, it is going to change the way business is done. It's going to change, uh, give opportunities to sell uh, capacity instead of capital. It's going to give new architectures to systems. It's going to change organizational structures. Uh, that said, the, the complexity of what we're trying to do and the variability and the breadth of all of the devices <clears throat> that are in the smart connected world are going to um, really require a multi-vendor community. And we don't expect we don't expect any single vendor to be able to deliver everything we need, hardware, software, the network's uh, infrastructure, the management systems, the, the, the network uh, diagnostics. It's all going to come from uh, multiple vendors, some of which operate in consortiums in their own ecosystems, uh, some which people will construct themselves. And therefore, the collaboration is critical. If we're going to do this, uh, it has to be done as a collaborative exercise. And then finally, uh, we're at that tipping point, as I said. 13% of the market is moving there today. 22% uh, is looking to pilot in the next 12 months. And while 47% doesn't understand it, uh, we hope after today's web webinar uh, that that number drops significantly. With that, I'm going to turn it back over to Mayhul for questions and answers. Thanks, Dan and Matt, for uh, presenting some of your insights on smart connector operations. Uh, we're actually a little over time, but um, we have a lot of good questions. Um, we probably might have time for one question. Um, so I'll, I'll quickly ask uh, the the one here. Uh, Dan or Matt, either of you can answer this. Uh, will the ISA 95 hierarchy remain relevant with IoT, or will we see direct connection from wireless sensors to enterprise? I, I can take that quick, Mayhul, and I just want to remind uh, all of our listeners that we will answer all the questions in our blog, so please check that out um, shortly um, over the next few days. But it, it, I believe it will remain relevant, uh, but it will evolve over time. So a lot of the structure, a lot of the good work that's been done is not for waste. Uh, it will remain relevant. Uh, it just is going to evolve. I don't know, Dan, if you have any additional thoughts there to wrap up. No, I, I think, you know, like everything, ISA 95 uh, is not cast in stone. It will evolve as well. Uh, standards do evolve over time. They change. Uh, sometimes it's just new iterations. Uh, we've seen TCP IP, you know, move uh, to new address spaces and things. We've seen uh, Ethernet move from uh, being a strictly hardwired to a, a wireless thing. So standards will evolve. S95 will evolve as well. Great. Thanks, Dan and, uh, and Matt. Uh, once again, as Matt mentioned, we'll answer all of your questions uh, via our blog, or you can also reach out to us at info at lnsresearch.com. Finally, we, uh, we thank you all for your time today, and we really hope that you are able to gain some valuable insights on the topic of smart connected operations, uh, and we look forward to seeing you in, in a future webcast. Thanks, and have a great day now.